Good morning. I want to welcome everyone to Mayor Brown and especially uh, Mayor Bowser. It's our honor to have you here today. I am the uh, direct. Well, I am the partner in charge of Mayor Brown, a 240-person uh, law firm in this city. Uh, we have uh, we are international, but 240 law lawyers here. We are pleased to be located in the Golden Triangle Business Improvement District for many reasons, but especially because of their commitment to safety, security, and preparedness. I want to recognize Leona Agreditas, the, um, who is here today and who is the executive director of the Golden Triangle, and congratulate them. <laughs> I want to congratulate them also on having received a leadership Excellence Award from the International Downtown Association for their Safety, Secure, and Prepared program. They regularly provide training for us uh, and also provide CPR training on Farragut Fridays. Um, at Mayor Brown, we are firmly committed to the safety and security of our staff, lawyers, guests, and clients. That's why in uh, more than 15 years ago, we put life-saving AED systems throughout the firm uh, and why we trained our floor uh, wardens on how to use them. Uh, I understand that this week has been called Safer, Stronger DC by the mayor. We're delighted that, that she's chosen this venue in order to launch the program, and it's my great pleasure now to introduce Mayor Bowser. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. And it is indeed Safer, Stronger DC Week, and we have been focused all week on all the agencies of our government, community partners, our business improvement districts, our business community partners, uh, who all together with us uh, can ensure that we have a city um, that is strong, safe, and uh, is prepared. I am I'm pleased that we're all here at Mayor Brown, and I want to thank you, Dan, and all the partners and associates here at Mayor Brown uh, for your commitment to Washington, D.C., for hiring people in Washington, D.C., and for staying in Washington, D.C. Let's give it up for Mayor Brown. I am also very delighted to be joined by members of uh, my public safety team, uh, our, our fantastic fire chief, Gregory Dean. Thank you, Chief Dean, for leading a wonderful fire and emergency um, medical services department in the District of Columbia. Uh, Karima Holmes, who is the director of the Office of Unified uh, Communications. I'm also very happy to have Karima here. And uh, I saw our chief medical uh, doctor, director, yeah, there he is, Dr. Holmes in the back for uh, the fire and emergency medical service. And also Cynthiana Lightfoot is here and she chairs our emergency um, management uh, uh, committee uh, that advises the chief and Dr. Holman in all emergency management issues. So thank you for being here, Cynthiana. <laughs> So I um, let's just talk uh, emergency management and preparedness for a second. One thing that Chief Dean uh, informed me when we were during our interview process is he knew that Washington, D.C. could be better and we would be better in terms of uh, responding to cardiac arrest. Uh, he also said there were a lot of things that we could do in the department, but we could do so much more if we enlisted our citizens to help us. Uh, we know uh, that it is the coworker, the family member, or the neighbor uh, who, in fact, is going to be the first on the scene. Uh, and the more prepared they are uh, as they call 911 to render aid to their coworker or family member or neighbor, the more people will successfully, uh, the more people will survive in a, a medical emergency. So over the last two and a half years, my team and I have uh, worked to ensure that we are doing everything possible to help meet this mission. Uh, we worked with the Council of the District of Columbia, for example, to uh, invest $12 million in the fire and emergency medical service, uh, and this is the largest such investment in uh, EMS reform history in the District of Columbia. And as part of this investment, we enhanced training opportunities for our FEMS teams. 
We improve the conditions of our fleet with more ambulances, more fire engines, and ladder trucks, and we have added more talent to the FEMS family. Uh, we have also renovated and modernized our buildings and facilities and have a plan to do even more. Uh, Chief Dean has focused uh, our FEMS team also on training more than 30,000 people in Washington, D.C. in hands-on heart CPR training. 30,000. We have strengthened also our 911 team, um, led by Director Holmes, uh, to add additional call takers and dispatchers uh, that has helped us lower our 911 response times. Uh, when I became mayor, uh, there was something like a seven or eight year period of time before that where we hadn't hired, I uh, added a capacity at the 911 call center. In that same amount of time, we added tens of thousands new <laughs> new DC residents, um, more restaurants, more nightlife, more people, more employees, which means more calls to 911 and more people who may need uh, our help. Uh, and so with the addition of these fabulous new call takers and Karima's um, leadership of the agency, we have been able to reduce 911 response times, the dispatch time, um, and we will continue to drive those times down. So every year, approximately 350,000 Americans die from sudden cardiac arrest, making it the leading cause of death in our country. Average survival rates from cardiac arrest nationwide are between 5 and 7 percent. But recent studies show that knowing the location of a nearby AED or automated external defibrillator can bring that average up to 33 percent. So here in D.C., we want to do our part to curb this disturbing trend. So today we're going to talk to you about two technologies, the AED link, um, which we are launching today. It helps 911 operators quickly find the closest AED to the scene of a cardiac emergency. It's important to note that if a 911 operator knows the location of the AED, they can instruct bystanders to get in to get there in time to help someone until paramedics arrived. Up until now, publicly available AEDs are rarely used in emergencies because 911 dispatchers and bystanders don't know where they are. So this is a huge win uh, for public safety in the district. The second piece of technology we're going to talk about is pulse point. It is a smartphone app that alerts you if someone goes into cardiac arrest near you. This tool will send vital information, including both the location of the victim and the nearest AED, so that people with, who are CPR trained uh, can have access to that information real time. We know that performing CPR immediately after cardiac arrest can double or even triple the chances of one's survival. So the Pulse Point app uh, will be another critical uh, tool in uh, our fight to keep D.C. residents alive in the case of emergency. So now I want to welcome Chief Gregory Dean, uh, who joined us in 2015 from the other Washington, where he had a, a great career, career in fire and emergency medical services. Uh, and we are uh, much grateful for his service to Washington, D.C. Thank you, Chief Dean. Thank you, Mayor. It's always nice to uh, work for somebody who cares about the people. The mayor's program of Safer, Stronger DC continues to get enhanced. And, and what we're going to talk to you about today is another example of how important it is that we, the community, take care of each other. We began in, with hands on heart. And Mayor, I will, I'm going to up your numbers and say 35, over 35,000 people have currently been trained in hands on heart. And what that means is that we have increased the population of, of lifesavers in our community. This is this community that swells to 1.5 million people. To have even more people involved in this goes a long way for saving lives. You know, we have our stats up here, and, and what they show you is this. They show you how we have improved. Uh, we've gone to 26%, and you'll also see just for the cardiac arrest, we've improved up to 5%. And the numbers mean this it means that we continue as a community to save people. 
And that is why, you know, even today we're here to ask that more people sign up and, and learn Hands on Heart. It is, a, it is an opportunity to uh, today talk to you about two new technologies that we're adding to save lives. The AED registry is something that works behind the scenes to a degree. It goes into our CAD system, our computer-aided dispatch, and it registers that and tells us where it is so the dispatchers will know where to, where to tell that citizen who has, who has gone out and learned CPR and then has an app on their phone that tells them where it is. This saves seconds. Uh, and seconds save lives. That's really what we're, we're talking about today. There is a there's an opportunity. There's a gentleman in the back, uh, Mr. Will Hinton. Will, would you raise your hand? So, so Will worked for St. John's College High School, and he was at work one day, and one of his colleagues went down. And this was before we added the app. He knew where the AED was. He was able to use that AED to save uh, one of his colleagues, and his colleagues are alive today because of his actions. Thank, thank you very much, Will. But what, but, how does that, but what that means to us is this. We are, the more people we register, the more people that are prepared to take care of their family and friends. And the more people that we save, the more people that we are able to look back and be satisfied that we did everything we could to take care of each other. Uh, so we do need your help. We ask for your help every day. Here's an opportunity for us to globally ask for all that help. An example is the Golden Triangle Business Improvement District. They do events all throughout, throughout, the, um, throughout the, di the district here. And then thank you to Mayor and, and Brown for what you guys do just for uh, assisting us here today. So the opportunity to take care of each other uh, rests in your hands. And we are asking you, uh, each and every one of our occupants and, and citizens here, to step up and be, uh, be of value not only to that person but to this community. So it's my pleasure to introduce the Director of the Office of Unified Communications, Director Karima Holmes. Thank you, Chief, and thank you, Mayor Bowser. Um, I want to thank you for your ongoing commitment to public safety and continued interest in and dedication to using technology to improve life here in Washington. Um, this technology, which was made uh, possible by our partnership with OCTO, led by our Chief Technology Officer, Archana Vamalapali, I would also like to thank them for their hard work for setting this up. I would like to also acknowledge many partners and business community partners in the public safety community who've come together for this great announcement today. This illustrates what we are trying to showcase this week with Safer Stronger DC. When our community comes together, all things are possible. I want to express my sincere thanks to the CTI Foundation, um, who you'll hear from shortly. The foundation's generous grant was able to support the intro of, of our Pulse Point application, and we're delighted to be able to offer this wonderful technology. I want to highlight some of what Chief Dean and Mayor Bowser just spoke on. This is the faster, this is that faster, uh, the faster the help gets to someone who is in cardiac arrest, the more likely they are to survive. If there's anything we can do to achieve that, it's worth serious consideration. The Pulse Point app and AED link registry move us forward immensely in that effort. Now, our 911 call takers will have the ability to see life-saving AED locations through our FEMS AED link. Operators can tell the caller what to get, where to get and use it on someone who is having cardiac arrest. It is very frustrating for those of us in the 911 line of work to know that in many cases, the AED could have been close by and available, but because the 911 operator nor the, the caller knew where the AED was. Our first responders do a tremendous job, and they get on the scene as quickly as they can, and they do save lives. But giving our community the ability to save a life is an extension of our first responders. The Post, Point further, the Post Point app further increases the community's ability to come through for someone in cardiac arrest. At OUC, we dedicate ourselves every day to getting the proper responses or resources to the scene of an emergency as quickly as possible. Being able to utilize technology in a way that would benefit someone in need is very fulfilling for those of us that has committed ourselves to public safety. I often say that our 911 operators are the first first responders, but actually any one of us could be in that situation where we can take on that role. 
not, none of us expect a call. I'm, I'm sorry, a family member, or a stranger, or even a coworker to be in distress or in need. But in that sense, with this Postpoint app, our AED Link Registry, we are all we all have the ability to save a life by including our community and solutions that can benefit any or all of, or all of us who might be in need. Can only strengthen our responses to help. Thank you again, Mayor Bowser, for creating this wonderful opportunity to help all of us in public safety and our community save a life. I, I now like to introduce CTIA Foundation Secretary Jamie Hastings. Thank you. So thank you, Director Holmes, and thank you, Mayor Bowser and Chief Dean, for your leadership on this issue. We are all very grateful for the tremendous work that you do. Today is about the power of connectivity, wireless connectivity, to help people and save lives. PulsePoint is a mobile app that connects CPR-trained people in a community to those who need help. It uses wireless connectivity to crowdsource CPR, to strengthen the chain of survival, and to save lives. Because, as we've heard, in emergency situations, every second counts. The CTI Wireless Foundation is proud to sponsor the deployment of PulsePoint in our nation's capital, bringing this life-saving service to the community at no cost. This is all about DC's larger transformation into a wireless, wirelessly powered smart city. DC is harnessing wireless connectivity to become a community that is, indeed, safer and stronger. I applaud Mayor Bowser, Director Holmes, and Fire Chief Dean for their forward thinking and for supporting PulsePoint. Recently, we had a chance to learn just how important wireless connectivity can be, and I'd like to share that story with you. It's a story of a six-week-old six boy, a medical emergency, and a CPR-trained mechanic. But it's also a story about how wireless can connect our communities and can turn strangers into life-saving guardians. That baby boy is Nolan. His grandmother is with us here today, Michelle, as well as her husband, Mick, and Uncle Shawnee. Thank you for joining us, and thank you, Michelle, um, for sharing your experience with us today. Nolan is living, breathing proof of the power of wireless connectivity and how PulsePoint can save lives. Now let's watch the story. All of a sudden, six-week-old Nolan's not breathing. He's not breathing. What's the location of your emergency? 131 South Sherman. I remember that call coming out. Station one's out of the area. It's going to be at least eight to ten minutes before we get a resource there. I was working in my shop. My cell phone made a noise that I hadn't really heard before. Things were dire. We have an infant who's not breathing. The Pulse Point app resides as a part of your smartphone. It sends an alert that there's a cardiac arrest in your nearby area. Do you want to respond? When the need arises, that's your chance to truly be a hero and save somebody's life. Pulled the phone out of my pocket and looked, and it said CPR needed, and it was a block and a half away. I saw my child there limp and blue. Are they awake at all? Yeah. Just jumped at my car and left. My hands were shaking. I remember screaming, help me somehow. And I was helpless to help him. It was today, the last day, that he'll be alive. Pulled up in front of the dance studio. I just saw him come running in. He got there somehow. He found out about it. I didn't know how at that point. And I picked him up and started doing some nose and mouth breathing for him. You could see the look in his eyes. He was like, help me, help me. Just wanted him to start breathing. The ambulance got there. And as soon as I handed him off to the paramedic, the baby started crying. And we both looked at each other and went, oh, that's a good sign. The Pulse Point app really allows us to leverage the benefit 
of the people in the community that want to be a part of the solution. He was the closest resource. Everybody should look up to Jeff. He is a hero. He's a miracle. If he didn't have that app, Nolan might not be here. Nolan's three years old. He's all that's good and none that isn't. A phone saved my son's life. He's overcome so much in his little life. I mean, he's fought to be here. We call him the little warrior. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I mentioned to Michelle earlier, I've seen this video a couple of times. I still get choked up. It's such an amazing story, so incredible. So it is my pleasure now to introduce Nolan's grandmother, Michelle Mulligan, who will share her perspective on Nolan's incredible story. Michelle? Thank you, Jamie. It's been three years, and I still get choked up. I'd like to thank everyone from our family for the opportunity to be a part of this Pulse Point launch and thank Shannon, way back there, I think, over there, <laughs> for being our voice from Pulse Point and being there for us from the very beginning. I'm Nolan's paternal Grammy. We learned Nolan had serious health issues the same ultrasound day that we heard, it's a boy. The sadness and the joy came all at once. Nolan has polycystic kidney disease and all the complications that come with that. Karen was ordered bed rest for the rest of her pregnancy, and I stayed with Mike, Karen, Ryan, and Lily, their two girls, in their home in Idaho for the months prior to Nolan's birth. The doctors had said we probably would not bring a baby home from the hospital. And after weeks in the NICU, we did. He was frail, but he was home. A transplant is not an option for a baby. We were told his best hope was to have the time to grow into his adult-sized kidneys. On September 1st, 2014, the Pulse Point app worked exactly as it was designed to do on Jeff Olson's phone in Spokane, Washington. I was waiting in the car so Karen and Ryan could shop, and only minutes had passed when I heard Nolan in distress in his car seat. I opened the back door, and he was already turning blue. I had Nolan in my arm and Lil under my arm as I ran into the ballet shop, and the young shop worker called 911. I have to tell you, the feeling of helplessness waiting is indescribable. I don't know CPR. I did not know CPR. I took Ryan and Lil outside, and I strained to hear the sound of an ambulance, and there was silence. Then out of nowhere came someone, Jeff Olson. I had no idea who he was when he pulled up with two wheels on the sidewalk, not like they showed in that video. <laughs> pulled up right in front of me in his mechanic's work uniform. And I knew nothing, but he was there to help. After a while, Jeff came out with Nolan Pink and crying and handed him off to the ambulance folks. And after Nolan and Karen had left in the, in the ambulance, I said to Jeff, where in the heck did you come from and how did you know? He showed me his Pulse Point app on his phone and we both stood there shaking. With a lot of great care, love, and a miracle, Nolan has had the time he's needed to grow into his supersized kidneys. He's three and doing really well. And since that day, I've been waiting for Pulse Point to come to the East Coast and to as many communities as possible 
thank you, Jeff Olson, and to Paul's point, that made it possible for him to respond. Thank you for giving our family, our feisty little warrior, the time he needed. I know there will be many new stories like this one now. Pulse Point is a miracle provider and an asset to any community. Learn CPR, download the app, and save a life. Thanks. Michelle, thank you for sharing that, that extremely moving story. It's, it's, a, it's important to understand just uh, how this technology works for everybody. Just as important is the other half of that link, which is the AD registry, which puts all this information into our computer aided dispatch so that we can get people there on time. The, um, the um, Elliot uh, Fish, who is the uh, atris, is responsible for that, and it's my pleasure to introduce Elliot to tell us the other half of how this all works together. Thank you, Chief. My name is Elliot Fish, and I am the founder and creator of the AED Link system. Um, Mayor Browser, thank you. Mayor Dean, uh, Chief Dean, thank you. Uh, Director Holmes, appreciate your help. Um, and the entire staff at Octo uh, for their hard work in making all this come together. Thirteen years ago, after starting an AED company, uh, I started to see news stories of, uh, of people dying in buildings with defibrillators. Uh, the first one was actually in nearby Salisbury, Maryland, where a man standing on the steps of the courthouse uh, literally dropped dead of cardiac arrest. Um, the first shock of an AED was by the first responders. Unfortunately, there was also an AED about 40 feet away inside the front doors of the county courthouse. Nobody that was with the, the, uh, the individual, that uh, the victim, uh, knew there was an AED there, nor did the dispatcher know there was an AED there. Unfortunately, that happens a lot. Uh, in reality, people are frequently dying in buildings with defibrillators. The Salisbury case, unfortunately, and many like it, illustrate the importance of establishing a community-wide, comprehensive AED and CPR response plan, which is what we're all doing here about today. Just placing AEDs in public places is not a solution for sudden cardiac arrest. If, if in the moment of need, people at that location are not aware of where that AED is. So, the chain of survival for cardiac arrest talks about the first point of recognition and then calling 911. Therefore, it is critical that the location of that AED, the nearest AED, be made available to the 911 dispatcher. Your new AED link system provides that information, allowing Director Holmes staff to look at the screen and instead of saying, if there's a defibrillator available, have somebody retrieve it in case we need it later and tell me when you have it, to say, I see there's an AED. It's on the second floor of Mayor Brown. Have somebody go get it. That's much more powerful. And that's what AED Link does. So it allows the dispatcher to send a secondary bystander to retrieve the nearest AED. I want to talk about responders. Responders are critical, as we've talked about. And the Pulse Point app is a fabulous way to get hands on a chest quickly. That is critical. The second or third part of the chain of survival, which starts with call 911, do CPR is get an AED. But as I mentioned, you can't go get one if you don't know where it is. So there's also responders in the DC registry. So it's important to understand that there is a DC AED registry. It is actually aedregistry.dc.gov. And it's a place where the individuals in your community can register their AED. So the registry talks about 
people who are nearby in the response team, and these people will quickly know where the AED is because we're telling the people who own the AED because we send out a signal, just like PulsePoint, but we send it out to the people who own the AEDs and are allowing them to get their AED and come and bring it. We actually had a case in Regina, Saskatchewan, uh, two weeks ago, where a, a, a member of a church um, got an alert from our system to bring the AED, and it was down the street at a home, and actually brought the AED, shocked the person two times. The person was up, sitting, and awake when EMS arrived. One of those great stories. We love to see them. So, of course, time is the most critical issue. Every speaker here has said that. This is the most critical, time-sensitive medical issue known. Today, there are over 1,800 AEDs in the Washington, D.C. AED registry. There is no fee for anybody to register their AED. So we like to say if you're, if you're registered, terrific. If you're not, do register your AED in your location. Um, again, it's totally free. The re again, plug for the registry, aedregistry.dc.gov. So let me say something about the responders in, our, in, in the DC AED, in your DC AED registry. We strongly urge, if you have your AED registered, to go back in and put responders in. These responders are the people who are trained in CPR, trained on that AED, and you're attaching them to those AEDs so they know where the AED is, they know how to use it, it's their AED, and they can bring it to the victim. So what that does is instead of the 911 dispatcher saying to somebody, go get one, we're able to have the person who has it bring it, which of course cuts the response time in half. And that's the medical time that we need to, Im to improve. Finally, by registering your AD, you can not only provide the much needed help in this most time sensitive emergency, but people who put their AEDs in the DC registry get a very important benefit, and that's monthly reminders to check their device. Many devices go unchecked, and it results down the line in a battery not working or an electrode expiring. So they get monthly reminders. They also get reminders to change anything that's about to expire. So it's a very valuable tool to make sure that the AEDs that are being summoned are operationally ready and they work. So again, it's a free service. It also keeps you in compliance with local laws and assures that the AEDs are quality controlled and in full working order. So thanks today to the vision of you, Mayor Bowser and Chief Dean, and the devoted professionals at the 911 Center and at OCTO. The citizens of Washington, D.C. now have quick access to quality controlled AEDs and the trained responders who know how to use them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I wanted to make uh, ourselves available for press questions uh, on topic first. Yes. Uh, for Chief Dean and Ms. Holmes. Mm -hmm. I downloaded the app a couple weeks ago, and I've just been watching it, and, and uh, it's fascinating to see how it works. However, it keeps saying medical emergency, medical emergency. It doesn't say CPR in progress. Can someone explain that? Why, why am I not seeing that? Because when I'm listening to the radio calls, I hear that the medics are being told that CPR is in progress. Um, so medical emergency it does not pertain to a CPR call. Um, the Postpoint app allows you to see any um, offense, and I think we filtered out some. And Dean can talk, uh, Chief Dean can talk about that. Um, so if there's a CPR, because I have the app downloaded, also if there's actually a CPR call where CPR is needed, it will pop up and it will literally say CPR. Um, so I don't know where the discrepancy comes there. I don't know if you want to add. So there's actually not a discrepancy. Um, we, uh, one of the things you can do with PulsePoint for people that want to know, they can see all the alarms we respond to. You, uh, your AED is set so that if you're in the vicinity of where there's an active case, it will ping you. Um, this, is meant, this is what's meant to happen when that happens. So the other, all, what you're seeing otherwise is, if you, hey, why is that fire truck going down the street? You can look at your PulsePoint, it'll tell you that. So there's, there's a difference right there. Exact address. It gives the intersection. Again, that is the ideal behind that is that 
we want to empower people to a degree, but we also want to maintain the privacy of, of where you're going and what's going on. And so, again, we have HIPAA laws. We have all these other things we have to apply. So you know that there's an EMS call. You do not know what type. You see that there's fire calls on there, and it tells you that what intersection we're going to. Again, it's a great opportunity to use technology to educate the public, but we also have to be concerned about people's privacy. Two other questions. Um, if I have to arrest within a quarter of a mile of you, you will get the address. Isn't that right? Correct. Right. Okay. Okay. So if I if I sign up for CPR certification, you'll, it will come up and give me the address. Get the you'll get you'll get you'll get pinged, and that, that's how you'll know the difference between just the streaming versus what you see in front of you. That answers that. Right. Okay, thank you. The last question is uh, the time that comes up here. When it, like, for instance, just now at 1140 Galveston Street Northwest, Ambulance 3 was dispatched for medical emergency. Is that time, 1140, the actual dispatch of help, or is this the time that OUC is putting into Pulse Point? So, so OUC does not have to put anything into Pulse Point. It's automatically fed over. And so that time you're getting is the time that we actually dispatch the call. So as you know, we get the call. That's the call received, and then we have to create the call. Once the call is created and deemed a CPR call, it stamps the time, which drops to fire and EMS for response. That would be the time that you get. If it says 1140, is that actually the time the firefighters are getting the call over the radio? Right. That's the same time we dispatch the call. Same time. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Any, other, any other questions? Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Well done. I like this.